Foundation. And I'd like to introduce Glenn Wright. Glenn Wright was born and educated in Toronto. Following graduation from the University of Toronto, he worked as a researcher for Pierre Burton before joining the Public Archives of Canada in 1975, as it was then known. During his public service career that spanned more than 30 years, Glenn worked as an archivist, historical research, oh, sorry, historical, not hysterical, <laughs> historical research officer, and for many years, assistant historian with the RCMP. Retired since 2006, he is a frequent speaker at family history and genealogical events, especially the OGS, with a special interest in Canada's military history and the men and women who have served in uniform. Glenn has also been associated with television programs such as Who Do You Think You Are, Ancestors in the Attic, and Engraved on a Nation. He has published widely in family history, genealogical and historical magazines and journals. Glenn is also the author of Canadians at War, 1914 to 1919, a research guide to World War I service records published by Global Genealogy in 2010, and Controversy, Compromise and Celebration, the History of Canada's National Flag, published by the Historical Society of Ottawa in 2017. Glenn has also been actively involved with the British Isles Family History Society of Greater Ottawa, affectionately known as Bafisco, and served as the society's president from 2010 to 2014. So at this point, I'm going to stop my share and let Glenn bring his presentation. There we are. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Nancy, for that very kind introduction. And thank you for uh, everyone for, for coming to this talk this evening. I'm speaking to you from uh, Ottawa, the nation's capital. And uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Now, researching the Second World War is becoming very popular. Uh, veterans, of course, are very quickly leaving the stage. Uh, more records are available. And uh, I think that we are, generally speaking, uh, aware of uh, that the war has ended uh, 75, 76 years ago now. And uh, there are a number of speakers this week. In fact, my friend Ken McKinley will be speaking in the OGS webinar series on uh, Thursday evening, and he tells me uh, he will be speaking about researching war dead, but also about service generally. And the Canadian War Museum later this week is also running a series on researching military ancestors. Um, my, my talk is, is very much introductory in a way. I'm going to concentrate on a few of the more important uh, steps that one needs to uh, follow. Uh, and uh, 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 finding out more about you know, your ancestor or whomever you're researching in the Second World War. It's a good time to reflect on this. Uh, as I said, it's been 76 years since the end of the war. Uh, Remembrance Day is right around the corner. And, uh, you know, one, uh, I think we're all aware that veterans are, are passing away very quickly. So what I'm going to do um, is actually review uh, service files, uh, how to obtain those service files, and then some immediate uh, research that one can do uh, with that information. Uh, so things got started, as some of you may know, Canada declared war a week after Britain did. Um, uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie King was insistent that Parliament uh, vote on this decision, although, uh, it must have been something that uh, there wasn't a lot of argument. Uh, but anyway, the Globe and Mail, of course, carried this wonderful large headline uh, declaring that Canada uh, was in the fight, as it were. Now, there are certain points of departure. And I think a lot of us of a certain generation have personal knowledge. We're talking about our fathers, 
uh, our mothers uh, who may have served in the war, uh, uncles, uh, and so on. And, and so that a lot of us probably have some knowledge of family members who served in the Second World War. So there's that family lore. There may be stories galore about uh, what happened uh, either at home or in England or on the European continent. Some people have documents. Um, it may be photographs, it may be diary, uh, it may be souvenirs. Uh, photographs, for example, and artifacts, uh, could badges, medals, helmet, pieces of uniform, things like that. In fact, uh, only in the past month, I acquired through uh, an in-law uh, a box, a trunk, a Second World War trunk, uh, with photographs and souvenirs, actually, from Italy and the Netherlands of an uncle of my, of my wife, a very interesting collection. But just a little bit of review here uh, and to give you some numbers. Uh, Canadian Army, you can see the numbers up there, vast numbers of, of uh, men and women served in the Army, the Navy, uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Merchant Navy, uh, which has sometimes been forgotten uh, when uh, in, in, in discussion of, of service in the Second World War. Uh, so that's well over a million uh, with, with those. And like I said, uh, women played a big role in this. The Canadian Women's Army Corps, known as the, the, the WACs, if you will, the Air Force were the WDs, and of course in the Navy, they were the Wrens. And uh, I'll, I'll mention some numbers a little later on, on the number of women who actually served in uniform. Now, you know, when we <clears throat> look at the First World War, um, a lot of us recognize names like Vimy Ridge or Eper and, and, and so on. Some of the other locations that were important to Canadians are a little bit uh, lost in the haze. Uh, uh, small locations in either France or Belgium. Quite different in the Second World War. It's a, it's a very different kind of war, as you know. And it's somewhat a little easier to... Uh, understand uh, exactly what was going on because, of course, unlike the first war, it was not a stationary war. People were uh, on, on the move generally. And these are just some of the key events. Of course, obviously, it's not everything, uh, but it's good to keep in mind a bit of a timeline when researching your ancestor. And these are pretty important events. Um, the fall of Hong Kong, uh, Canadians were in Britain in vast numbers, even by Christmas 1939, and not a lot happened, uh, with the exception of the Dieppe Raid in August 1942, uh, a disastrous Dieppe Raid. And really, it, things really didn't get going until the invasion of Sicily and Italy by the Allies in the summer of 1943. And of course, we all know that that eventually led to the invasion of France in June 1944 and the liberation of Northwest Europe, including Holland. Uh, on the home front, it's important for those who are researching uh, men and women who served in the Air Force, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan uh, over 100,000 uh, men were trained as uh, uh, pilots and air crew and so on in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan in over 100 facilities in Canada, and they are all really well documented. Uh, and of course, the RCAF was involved in the air war, the, 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 the bombing of Germany and so on and so forth, and we can't forget the Navy. Uh, the uh, movement of personnel and goods uh, by the Merchant Navy, the convoys, the Battle of the Atlantic, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of stuff there, uh, but uh, the chronology breaks down rather nicely. And I think it's uh, somewhat more understanding or understandable uh, than uh, getting your mind around um, some very small locations in France and Belgium during the First World War. Now, we're going to talk about service records, and, and this, this has come up a lot in the past. It's, it, this, is where, this is where the records are not. <laughs> and, uh, the Canadian War Museum is a wonderful research institution. Not only the, the, the museum side of it, they've got an excellent library and an excellent archives, okay? But the service files, service records are not there. Likewise, a lot of people think that the Legion has these records, and if they don't, and of course, uh, other people assume that national defense has the records. 
uh, that's sort of logical. And of course, uh, others think that maybe Veterans Affairs is holding on to these records. They certainly have veterans records, but they don't have any kind of service records. In fact, the records have been at Library and Archives Canada for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, the service records, military service records have always been at the archives. Now, uh, the service files are very extensive. In fact, uh, I understand that they fill uh, over 30 kilometers of shelf space, well over a million files, of course. And there are certain rules that are still in effect here. Living veterans, uh, can ask for their file. They can ask the archives for their file and they will be given a copy of the file. If the service person, the veteran has been deceased for less than 20 years, uh, next of kin can ask for the file and some information, but not all of it will be released. Uh, useful in itself because it allows research and other sources. It, it's not everything though. If the person has been deceased for more than 20 years, then anyone can ask for the file. I can ask for your father's file. Uh, and there's no restriction on the records. And of course, uh, if, if you've done any work on the Second World War, you know that the war dead, uh, all those files, uh, some 45,000 are open and available uh, to the, but they're online. And I'm gonna show you that later if you're not familiar with that. Uh, so that's important to remember. Uh, so that's who's got the files and those are some of the rules, okay? But what we're gonna do, I'm going to advise people to use the access to information and privacy law. It's a law, I mean, laws are there to be used. Uh, there was a time when the archives uh, preferred people to simply put in a request. And I understand some people waited about two years to get information. Uh, they seem to have changed their tact in the past uh, six or eight months. So a lot of people knew that you could use access to information to get the file a lot quicker. So if you're not familiar with it, you might want to look up online. Uh, I think Treasury Board Canada on their website talks about ATIP, but the archives does too, and I'm going to show you that. Uh, it can be uh, the form that the archives has an online form that you can use. You identify the individual, uh, full name, date of birth. Uh, if you have a service number, that would be fine. If you don't, even that's fine. Identifying the person with their name and birth date should be a, sufficient unless you're a Smith or a Brown. Uh, you have to provide proof of death. Uh, it can be anything. It can be a picture of a tombstone. Uh, it can be a newspaper obituary. It doesn't have to be a proper uh, death certificate. I would advise you to request the entire file. Uh, the archives does offer what they call a genie package, a genealogical package of about 50 or 60 documents. Uh, I think most of us would like to see everything, even though there's a lot of bureaucratic paperwork. Okay, I warn you, uh, but uh, it might be a good idea to request the whole file. It will cost $5, that's under the access to information law. And in theory, the archives has 30 days to provide you with a copy. Uh, of course, the 30 day limit has fallen by the wayside uh, because of COVID. Uh, they are doing their best. And uh, it's certainly going to be quicker than putting in a simple request for the file, okay? Uh, and they will provide the file in a digital format. They'll, they'll digitize the file for you. And when some of these files are 200 plus pages, you know that that $5 and a little bit of a wait is worth, is, is worth it, okay? And here's where you find it. Military heritage, I, 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 do people call them landing pages or whatever? Anyway, on the LAC website, and it's a website uh, you, everyone should be familiar with, but if you're doing any kind of military research, it's the military heritage section of that website that's really, really important for all military events in Canada, not just Second War, of course. So uh, down there on the right, request for military service files, kind of an innocent little, little link there. And that takes you to yet another page 
where, uh, again, they repeat a lot of the information, and then it's got this submit a request to LAC for restricted records. And, and one has to be careful because they're not, they're, they're not getting into ATIP yet, okay? They, they haven't even mentioned it at this point. And you actually go to the next page where they do talk about formal and informal requests. And, and you don't want to do an informal request, okay? That's the one that takes a long time. You want to put in a formal ATIP online request, that $5 I spoke about. And they even provide a form that you can fill in. And uh, the only other thing you need to do then is probably upload uh, the proof of death. Um, their, their website, for some reason, uh, it, it doesn't work with the online application, you have to do it after the fact. But after you submit your request, they're gonna send you an email anyway, and they're gonna apologize and say it's gonna take longer than the 30 days. Uh, but anyway, at least you'll know that it's being looked at, okay? Uh, and, and, and that's the service file. And I'm, I'm, we're gonna get into different kinds of files in a, a, a moment, actually. So anyway, what, what's this all about? What's this, this going to tell us about the service? And of course, there's um, uh, attestation or enrollment. Uh, the Navy, for example, used the word enrollment, uh, but it's uh, going to be a document, uh, perhaps uh, like you saw in, um, uh, in the first war, an attestation paper. The file will uh, include some personal history. Uh, of course, it, it will get into uh, postings, uh, promotions and in the, if you're looking at the Air Force, you're, in, you're it's a bonus because you're also going to find a photograph in most cases of the person that you're uh, doing research on. Um, and I'll, I mean, we're going to look at some of these documents in a moment. I just wanted to emphasize uh, the personal information, much different. And I'm assuming a lot of us have looked at first war files. Um, and, and there's a lot of information, there. there's a lot of personal information, but not anything like on a second war file. So there's a fair bit of information on one's education, even the schools that, that a person attended, employment history. Uh, a lot of the files, maybe not every file has an employment history form. Uh, when I fetched the file for my uncle, uh, one of my uncles, my cousin was surprised to see all the things that his father did. And, and, and my uncle Gord went right back to when he was 12 or 14 years old and was delivering groceries on a bicycle. And he included that in the employment history. References, uh, people uh, sometimes had a reference uh, from uh, an older adult or a, or a school teacher or a, a, a church official uh, about their, their qualities and so on and so forth. Uh, religion is noted, marital status, medical information in, in more detail than you would find on a first war file. There's a personality assessment, okay, that, you know, yeah, George is going to make a great officer or, you know, this kind of thing. Um, they also record any interest that the person might have. And I mean, sports and clubs and uh, hobbies, that kind of thing are, are recorded. And in the Air Force, they ask for nationality of parents, okay? So there's quite different than what you've been used to if you've been looking at a, a first war file, for example. Now, I've broken them down because uh, record keeping and documentation varied according to service, okay? Um, you think of the Canadian military, but it's not uh, homogenous, okay? They, uh, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy uh, kept their records differently, okay? And so the service records are actually somewhat different in, 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 in the three cases. Now in the army, uh, over 700,000 men, including 21,000 women joined the Canadian Women's Army Corps. We're gonna look at service records and just a word about regimental numbers. And, and some of you are probably sitting on, on documents uh, that you've um, had in the family. The regimental numbers were actually in the army were allotted by military district. Now, military district, uh, there are 13 in Canada, although they skipped a couple of numbers. They align up largely with the provinces, okay? Although Ontario had two numbers, two and three. Uh, Quebec had two, uh, three and four, that kind of thing. Uh, number 10 was Manitoba and Northwest Ontario. So not, not exactly aligned to provinces, but um, they not only 
um, the, the regimental numbers uh, were alphabetical, okay? So military district 10, as I said, is Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario. All the regimental numbers for someone who enlisted in Manitoba will begin with the letter H, okay? And it goes on like that um, uh, throughout the different districts. And so uh, if somebody said, hey, I've got a B number, my dad had a B number, uh, he, uh, he, and he volunteered in Ontario. Okay, it goes like that. It's very interesting. And uh, you won't believe this, or maybe you will, uh, all the women, uh, all their files were prefixed with the letter W. Okay, just something to uh, a little bit different than the first one. Now here's a typical attestation form uh, for this, a Russell Cooper. Um, and, and you can see there, well, yeah, maybe you can't, but you can, uh, name, address, date, and place of birth, occupation, marital status, uh, religious denomination, name and address of next of kin. And this is his agreement to serve in the army. And every file will have an attestation document. Um, and um, I'm, I'm gonna show you that there's a little bit different for the Air Force and the Navy, but essentially they capture the same information. And on the right, there's, there's a little bit more uh, than a physical description. Uh, there's the height, the weight, the complexion, color of eyes, and, and there's overall development and that kind of thing. A little bit, a little bit more detail than uh, one, one gets for the, say, a, vet, uh, a soldier in the First World War. The other item that's going to be found on every file, and, and this is really the critical document, is the statement of service. And this will document every time Russell Cooper moved, okay? His postings, whether he went on leave, when he was sick, uh, if he was promoted, uh, where he trained, uh, when, and, uh, when and how he got to England, uh, and there's more training, believe it or not, uh, and it will follow him through until he is deployed. Uh, in this case, uh, he went to France uh, just at D-Day, uh, 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 just at D-Day. Um, so this is, this is really an important form. Unfortunately, they're handwritten. Some of them are tough to read, but this, this is really critical to understand where your um, uh, your man or woman was um, at, at any time. Now, once we know that, once we know that a person served in a particular unit, which you can get from the file, or you may already know it um, from documents in your own possession, what you really need to look at, and what's really critical, are the Canadian Army War Diaries, okay? Um, similar again to, to the First World War. Uh, they're probably more typewritten than the Second War, thank goodness. Anyway, it's a narrative of daily activities. It's a diary, of course. Um, there much more um, documentation in the Second War, daily orders, operational orders. There'll be a return of officers. If you're researching an officer, there will be a return every month indicating that a, he was there. And, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, communications logs, uh, there could be maps, uh, this kind of thing, uh, social news, okay? Uh, all kinds of stuff in a diary. Uh, the, the big difference between this war and the first one is that units in the army had to keep a diary from the day they were authorized. So obviously they're authorized in Canada, they're authorized to enroll people, to enlist people, they're authorized to organize. And from day one, they had to keep a diary. Uh, in the first war, uh, units only had to keep a diary when they were in France or Belgium. And very, very rarely will you find uh, a CEF battalion with a war diary, certainly not in Canada. Uh, once in a while, you will see a diary compiled in England in the first war, but not very often. The second war, totally different. Um, and every unit of the army, right down to the cooking school, okay, wherever that was, had to keep a diary. And so it's important to know that. Uh, and a lot of these are available. And I'll, I'll get to that in a few moments. Uh, now, our friend Russell Cooper, I'm just going to show you some examples of the diary, just to show you how full they really are. Um, 
Here is uh, the 12th uh, Field uh, Regiment Artillery. And uh, they, were, they spent 11 months at Camp Sussex in New Brunswick. Uh, in July 18, 1941, the men boarded a train for Halifax. And the diarist notes that the men were cheerful and in excellent spirits. It didn't last long. Arriving at Pier 21 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the regiment was immediately directed to a waiting ship, the Duchess of York. This ship, wrote the diarist, was hardly what the regiment anticipated. The quarters provided for all ranks were cramped. About 25% had to spend the night on deck. In addition to the 12th Field Regiment, the ship was carrying civilians, British troops, Navy and Air Force personnel, rescued sailors, free French, free Belgians, and Canadian troops. Nevertheless, discipline was excellent. And after all, the 12th Field Regiment was on its way to the war. June, June 1944, D-Day. And again, very interesting, on the 4th, uh, the troops were loaded on their landing crafts. Uh, it says it was a tight fit, but all were loaded without incident. The wind blew up in the afternoon and gale warnings were sent out. Exercise overlord was postponed for 24 hours and we all know what happened. On June 5th, it was a go. And on June 6th, uh, the diarist talks about the assault on the beaches. Uh, it's, uh, you, it almost, some diarists can almost make it feel that you were there. Uh, and if you haven't looked at a Second War diary, they, a lot of them are like this. They're, they're completely um, full of, 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 of human information, a human feeling, actually. And of course, it's a secret document. So it allows the diarist to talk about exercise overlord and so on and so forth. They, you know, they, 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 they were secret at the time. Um, and again, uh, this is June, a continuation of June 6, and you can see how detailed that is. Um, and, and one reading this, in fact, can actually sense that, that, that success was within reach. In fact, on June 8th, the diarist does say that everyone felt we were going stronger and stronger. Um, but, you know, diaries, and uh, there, there's a, a bit of a sad story here. In August 1944, um, on August 14, 15, 1944, the 12th Field Regiment was actually attacked uh, by friendly fire, which is, is something we've all heard about in whatever conflict we've been interested in. And the RAF, in fact, um, mistook uh, the 12th Field Regiment. Uh, they were uh, in, at rest, I believe. And in fact, 11 were killed and over 50 wounded. Okay, so it, it, it happens in, in war. And just one last entry, and this is from the end of the war on May 8th, 1945, VE Day. Uh, it says that the regiment is busy on the cleaning of guns and vehicles. And uh, of course the war is over. And at two o'clock there was, uh, the soldiers were paraded and they had to, or perhaps they wanted to listen to speeches from both Winston Churchill and King George VI. And so that's a war diary. And, and a lot of these are available at Library and Archives Canada. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, they're, they're available on the, on the LAC website, but they're also available on Heritage Canadiana. Uh, unfortunately, Heritage Canadiana doesn't have an index to them. So you have to start at Library and Archives Canada with the, the unit that you're interested in. It will give you a microfilm reel number and you can go over to Heritage and, and, and look at them there, which is a lot easier than looking at them at, on the LAC website actually. So those are war diaries. Now the Royal Canadian Air Force, well over 200,000 service personnel. Uh, and they had, uh, you know, there was almost, almost 18 or 19,000 RCAF personnel uh, killed during the war. Including 17,000 women in the WDs, the Women's Division. Of course, we wanna look at their service records. And again, their numbering system is a little bit different. People entered the Air Force with an R number. And if the individual went on to be commissioned as a pilot or a navigator or whatever, he was given another number, okay? A totally different number and it was prefaced with the letter J. Now, instead of war diaries, we're going to look at what are known as operations record books or orbs, okay? 
And, and they also include, uh, I mean, if, if a father or grandfather was in a, 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 a bombing squadron, that's great. Uh, but um, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, BCATP facilities in Canada, I mentioned there were over 100 of them, about 103. Uh, all those facilities throughout Canada, they had to keep a diary. And so you can actually follow, you can follow your, your ancestor through training uh, and actually stop at the various uh, facilities where he was trained. And uh, there could very well be information uh, about him as an individual. Now, as I did say a while ago, the service files for uh, an Air Force personnel often include photographs. Um, now, sort of, you, you sort of scratch your head and sort of wonder, well, why didn't the Army do that? Or why didn't the Navy do that? I don't know. Uh, but the Air Force did, and it's to our, our benefit. And there's one document in particular that's very, very important on a file, and it's this record of service. Uh, here's a fellow, Charles Austin Wright. He is not a relation to me, as far as I know. He was born in 1918. And the top left lists his training, okay? He started out at number one Manning Depot in Toronto. He probably walked into the office and said he wanted to join the Air Force. Uh, he did some service flying training at Brantford. Uh, he was at number one initial training school in Toronto. He then went to number one Air Observer School at Toronto. It was located, I believe, at Malton. And he was commissioned on 11th of September, 1942. And you can see in the top left-hand corner that his R number has been scratched out and a J number placed there. And there's a photograph of him in civilian clothes. Um, he's about 23 years old at the time. Now he's become an officer and the card, and these are extra large cards, okay? They're often folded on the file, but they're, they're large. And of course now his, his J number takes precedence and there's an indication in the middle there of his postings and attachments. And uh, this is all very interesting because it does uh, have him now as an officer. He's, he's gone to the United Kingdom. He does some initial training. The, 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 the uh, units are identified there. And then he's assigned to 419 squadron. I believe it was known as the Moose squadron. And in this case, um, he did uh, 10 operations uh, and on the 11th, he was killed. Okay, and I, I um, yeah, uh, it was the file. I, I thought this was the easiest way to show you these large documents. Uh, and unfortunately, this uh, Charles Austin Wright uh, was, was killed in action. And in fact, the file uh, actually includes him in uniform. Okay, and, and you can see you've got the R number there and the, the J number is, is a little bit uh, vague on the photo, but uh, like I said, most, most files, Air Force files, will include a photograph, and it, it's very interesting. Now, these operation, operation record books, this is just a, a generic sample. Uh, they don't have a fancy title like the War Diary, a fancy title page, uh, but you can see they're typewritten. Uh, they are very, very extensive. Uh, so every unit of the Air Force, uh, be it... Um, uh, like I said, Army cooking school, I think the RCAF had a cooking school and they had to keep a diary like everybody else. And all the units, all the units, all the facilities in Canada, the training facilities, likewise had to keep diaries. Now, the advantage of the British Commonwealth Air Training uh, Plan facilities in Canada, they were stationary. Some of them existed for five years, a bombing and gunnery school, uh, an observer school or whatever. Uh, and because they were stationary with a staff that didn't move, um, they often published newsletters or little newspapers and things like that. And those things ended up on the diaries, okay? So it's really important that once you, if you're doing RCAF, if you can uh, determine where someone was trained, uh, and, and that might have taken a, a year, a year and a half, it's important to look at uh, every facility where that person was because you don't know what you're going to find. And here we have 419 Squadron. They're at Middleton St. George in England. And again, down at the bottom, August the 9th, um, uh, what did I say, 43, there is a description of, of the aircraft that are about to take off. They, they indicate there were um, 
Uh, 16 uh, aircraft were detailed for an operation against Mannheim, Germany. Uh, one of the planes uh, uh, did not take off. It blew a tire on the runway and did not go. Uh, the other 15 did. And he does say there that one did not return. And that was the plane that, uh, that Wright was in. He was a navigator. And a plane was, uh, they don't know for sure, but it was probably shot down over Germany. Okay. And, and they say it very um, almost in passing that the one plane didn't come back. But the real bonus to these operation record books, and I said that uh, Wright was on his 11th mission. Um, he did 10 before that. And of course, you've, you've heard about people who did 20 and 30 and, and so on and so forth. But for this fellow, all 10 are, are documented in the diary, okay? But not on his service file. And that is the real value of an operations record book. And I'm going to show you his last uh, operational uh, flight up there with the star. Uh, it has the date, the type and the number of his aircraft, the names, the numbers and the ranks of the crew. Okay, there was a crew of seven. Okay, uh, it gives the target, which was Mannheim, Germany, the bomb load and the comment. And this I find very sad uh, and very almost routine in a way. Its failure to return must be presumed to be due to enemy action. Uh, the planes that did return, you see the little paragraphs there. Uh, it talks about their success or, or, or not. In fact, the next two planes down there, the first word they use is successful, uh, where they dropped their bombs, whether they were um, uh, shot at, whether they were damaged at all, whatever, and when they got back to Middleton St. George. And I want to emphasize that this kind of information is not found on a service record. It's only in an operations record book. Uh, so very, very important to look at these uh, operations books. Uh, they are virtually all on heritage. Again, one has to go to LAC, uh, do an initial search. It will come up with a, um, uh, a microfilm reel number. And uh, usually there's an indication that it's available on Heritage. If not, uh, always check those microfilm real numbers against Heritage, uh, where there are no indexes for some reason, uh, and, and, and the diary's there. And of course, like I said, the Heritage site is, is, a, is a good one to use. Now, the Navy, of course, you know, different again. Uh, less than 100,000 service personnel, included 7,100 women. And again, we're going to look at service records. Uh, there is something called on the LAC website on that second war landing page there, military history page, uh, something about service ledger sheets, and uh, they only go to 1941, but I'm going to show you one uh, because, of course, uh, they, they were used throughout the war. Now, the Royal Canadian Navy, you think, okay, uh, men in blue uniforms on ships, well, there, there was, it, was, it was a little bit different. Um, Men could have served in the Royal Canadian Navy and their numbers begin with the letter N or the Naval Reserve and their numbers begin with the letter A. Or if they were in the Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve, those numbers began with the letter V. If you see them on something you've got at home or uh, in any kind of research that you're doing. Uh, all officers, their numbers began with the letter O. Um, so that, that sort of makes sense, doesn't it? And I'll just show you one of these. Uh, these ledger sheets here, there's quite a good explanation of them. Uh, they do take in the first war. They also take in some uh, Newfoundland fishermen who were involved in the first war, who, who uh, were helping off the coast of Newfoundland. Of course, it's not part of Canada. Uh, but there are ledger sheets for a lot of these folks, uh, and they're very interesting. So it's, it's mainly First War, but they do cover the first uh, year or so of the Second World War. And there's a pretty good explanation there of the sheets, um, but they don't, uh, they, the, the sheets aren't there. That's the problem. And here's an example of one, a Walter Gordon Randall. Um, and uh, he was in... Uh, now his, you'll see that he doesn't have a, a letter in front of his number, uh, but he was uh, uh, Naval Reserve. And it lists over on the left side, 
uh, his um, the shipper establishment and his rating or his rank in the Navy by rating and the dates at that particular rating. Uh, and it's got his conduct over in the middle of the, it's a, 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 a large document, a large document, that's what it is. Uh, his character, very good, his efficiency and so on. Uh, down in the bottom right, uh, this fellow died um, in the war and the memorial cross went to his mother, his next of kin. And um, some of the forms actually have next of kin information across the top. Uh, so the form did change during the war. Uh, there's, uh, one has to be careful here uh, because they list shore establishments or, or every establishment the Navy had was an HMCS. So you see over there HMCS Staticona, uh, that's uh, Halifax. And so one has to be a little bit careful. Uh, at the bottom of that list, he was serving on HMCS Valley Field, which was torpedoed off the coast of Newfoundland in 1943. Um, but um, uh, it, or May of 1944, rather. And so one has to be careful. Uh, there is a website, uh, all one word, called For Posterity's Sake. Again, For Posterity's Sake. Uh, and it's a wonderful um, uh, listing of ships and naval information and so on and so forth. Uh, another ship, uh, another website that does very well with Canadian naval records is all one word, Ready Eye Ready. And you can find out that some of these um, uh, locations listed on here, in fact, uh, were nothing more than shore establishments. But he did serve on uh, the Valley Field. Uh, earlier on, he served on the Midland and, and so on. There's a, a, some indication there he was at sea, needless to say. Um, so uh, important to keep that in mind. Um, in fact, in the talks I've given, I don't think I've actually met anyone doing research on a Navy, uh, a Navy uh, veteran, uh, but the records like they for Air Force and the Army are very good. And of course, they're at LAC. If, if one orders a file, you know, away you go. Um, and uh, you'll be able to follow this. There are no um, diaries for the Navy. Uh, the, the archives, the LAC will direct you to ship's logs uh, they're not going to tell you very much except the location of the ship. Uh, not very good. There is something called reports on proceedings. Uh, they're, 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 not, they're not extensive. They're not for every ship involved in the war. Uh, there is a guide on the military heritage uh, part of that LAC website. Uh, there is a guide to vessels, a guide to Canadian naval vessels. And it's a document online and they've got whatever records are available uh, for whatever ship in, uh, in the Navy, okay? There's a lot of stuff there. And a lot of those files are not digitized. These are, are records that are in the archives and they've, they've created an index by the name of the ship, which is uh, very uh, helpful actually. Now the Merchant Navy uh, has sort of got a short, short shrift here and they, and they got short shrift from me because I say there's should be 12,000 men and women, not what I've written there. Uh, of course, as some of you may recall that there was quite a campaign to have merchant seamen recognized as veterans. And in fact, it wasn't all that many years ago that a book of remembrance was put together. And this, this creates a bit of a problem for the records. Uh, there were 25,000 voyages, roughly uh, 625 vessels. And you're not gonna believe this, but there is probably a file at the archives for every one of those voyages. Uh, this was taking uh, personnel uh, to uh, the United Kingdom. It was taking a mat war material and uh, food and, and whatever else to Britain and also bringing back at the end of the war and during the war, uh, uh, military personnel. And of course, in 1946, 47, the war brides and that kind of thing. So uh, all the merchant navies involved in all of this. The service records for what there is are held by Veterans Affairs Canada, largely because they assembled them in order to create the Book of Remembrance for one thing and to identify those who served in the Merchant Navy. And likewise, the war did. Um, uh, they look after all that, okay? Uh, they are not included in the, um, uh, certainly not Commonwealth War Graves. You know, I'm not sure. 
Anyway, uh, the war dead again, I'll show you there's a search, the Veterans Affairs has a little search thing, you can search for war dead. And the service records you have to apply, it would apply the same as LAC for the uh, Army Navy Air Force. Uh, an access request, a $5 access request is probably the best way to get the record if you have someone who served in the Merchant Navy. And uh, those who died are, there is a book of remembrance. Um, now I'm going to show you uh, what one of these Merchant Navy files looks like. Uh, it is of someone who died and that was the only way that I could obtain the file. I, I, I couldn't get a file of someone. I didn't have any names, to be, to be quite honest. And what they do, they've got these little summary cards and they've got the name of the person where he's buried. And you can see they've blocked out certain information they didn't want me to know, which is kind of weird since the fellow was uh, long dead. But anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there uh, because they certainly do tell me uh, a fair bit about him. Uh, what ship he was on, uh, the official number of the ship, something about next of kin, although they blotted that out, even though uh, they're probably deceased as well. Uh, he was from Dufferin County here in Ontario. Um, he's also uh, commemorated on the Halifax War Memorial, okay? The odd thing about these files is that they also include a summary of all the correspondence that the um, uh, merchant shipping people received uh, about this particular uh, merchant seaman. Uh, you can see some of it's been blotted out, but they, the actual letters are not there, but this, this annotation, this, this ongoing summary uh, is included, okay? It, it's a little bit unusual. I assume on a file, uh, if one made an access request, you would get a file without all the stuff obliterated. But anyway, it's better than nothing, okay, at this point. The other bonus for Merchant Navy, and it's the only wartime service where this happens, uh, there's a photograph and his um, fingerprints, okay? Uh, this is his application for a Merchant Seaman uh, certificate, this man, Norman Hammond. And uh, uh, it's uh, very interesting, this fellow, uh, in fact, was uh, in, in the Merchant Navy long before the war. In fact, he had some kind of um, uh, reputation. Uh, he actually uh, sailed around the world uh, on, a, on a Norwegian ship. Uh, he was in the Merchant Navy sometime in the 30s, uh, was there during the war, uh, and he was uh, sunk, uh, his ship was sunk in February 1942. But there's enough on the file. It's got his next of kin, and. Uh, you know, his, his education, his training uh, to be in the Merchant Navy, that kind of thing. Uh, and he was uh, on a ship that was hit by a U-boat uh, in the Caribbean, okay? But um, uh, aside from the fact that he's war dead, I just wanted to show you the kind of information that is available uh, for one who served in the, merchant, uh, in the Merchant Navy. Now, just a word about war dead. I know my friend Ken McKinley is going to talk about this on Thursday night in one of his OGS seminars, but I thought I'd, I'd very quickly go over War Dead, uh, just some, some key sources, and I also I want to show a couple of things that you might not be aware of. Uh, on the left, of course, is the famous Benny Sur Mer Canadian Cemetery up and behind um, uh, Juneau Beach in France, or for the, uh, a lot of our uh, men who were killed at D-Day and, and beyond. And, and of course, uh, the invasion of Italy a uh, big battle at Ortona in December 1943. A lot of Canadians died in the Italian campaign. And one of the larger cemeteries is the Morrow River Canadian Cemetery in, in Italy. Now, war dead, as I said at the very beginning, the service records of the war dead are, are available and have been available for several years. The files are for those considered to be war dead from September the 10th, 1939, remember when Canada declared war, to December 31st, 1947, um, are open to the public for research purposes. And this is death from all causes. So it could be killed in action, died of wounds, missing and presumed dead, illness, accident, even suicide. These files are especially valuable for, for anyone. If, if uh, There's a lot of family history and genealogy in these files. Now, um, 
you can ask for the whole file if you want, um, like any other file. Uh, they won't have any trouble uh, vetting it for you because it's all available. And there is an index uh, right here on this part of the website. You can search the database. Um, now, Ancestry, our friends over at Ancestry have digitized uh, every one of these files. Now, uh, what Ancestry and the archives did, however, they chose from every file about 50 or 60 documents that they thought you and I would be interested in. Okay, so you're not seeing the whole file on Ancestry, okay? If you wanted to see the whole file, whatever it looks like or consists of, you would have to make a request at LAC. On the other hand, you can look uh, at the Ancestry database there. If you're not an Ancestry user, you know, a lot of this stuff is often available uh, around Remembrance Day, and I'm, I'm sure it will be next week. Uh, and again, uh, they've digitized these 50 or 60 key documents, what they thought were key documents, and, and they're included in this collection of, of War Dead. And there's about uh, 45,000 uh, files there that, you know, they, they are interesting. You get the attestation paper, you get the statement of service. If it's Air Force, you get the photograph. Um, uh, there'll be information about uh, possibly what happened. And, and some of the files even have burial information, although uh, some of the uh, men who died in Germany were actually uh, repatriated and buried elsewhere. Um, and some were left in Germany. And sometimes that's on the file, okay? Um, and in addition to the service information, and, and again, you just have to say a little prayer and hope that the Ancestry and the LAC people did this, there's sometimes fair correspondence with the family. And so uh, a, a person's uh, soldier's wife or his, or his parents would write and they would want more information, that kind of thing. And of course, a lot of this starts off with the letter that, uh, that, that people received. And here's the case of Russell Cooper, who was with the um, 12th Field Regiment in artillery. And it says uh, you know, that he's, he's lost his life, official information, dies, your son died of wounds in action with the enemy and so on. And of course it's got his number there, B11148. And that tells me right away that Gunnar Cooper was uh, enlisted in Ontario. And, and we know that he did. The 12th Field Company was from the Guelph area, okay? So that one would hope is on the file. Now, the other thing on the files for the dead, one of the, one of the best documents I've ever seen on a military file for everyone who died in the Second World War, there is something called an estate document, okay? Because they had to sort out the person's estate. And here it is for Russell Cooper. And over on the right-hand side, he had to, uh, not he, but his survivors had to indicate the names of the ages of his parents, and his siblings and, and where they lived. If they were in the military, in fact, their numbers are given, okay? They're identified by their, their service number. And, and on top of that, I don't show it here, the next page, they actually recorded the marriage information of the parents and where they married, okay? And this was all in order to divide up uh, uh, Russell's estate and of course, in this case, the estate would have consisted of, 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 of funds that he received at the end of the war. Like oh, there was a war service gratuity and this kind of thing. Uh, it's, not, it's not pension, it's, it's whatever was left in his own, um, his own bank accounts or whatever. The other thing these files do, the war dead files, they will often list uh, a person's belongings. And again, uh, it, it's um, uh, bittersweet uh, to read some of the list uh, some of these lists, but they're often included on, on the war dead file. So now, of course, the other place you want to look for war dead is the Canadian Virtual War Memorial. It's part of Veterans Affairs. Uh, it's, uh, it, it seems to improve all the time. You can do a search there by name and by war, and it will tell you where a person is buried or commemorated if there is no known grave. Uh, you can also access the Book of Remembrance on this website if you want to see uh, what it looked like when they compiled the Book of Remembrance uh, in the 50s. And, and there's um, the real advantage of the War Memorial. And if you've heard me speak about the first war, I, I call it a living memorial because you can add information to the Canadian Virtual War Memorial. 
Uh, you can add, and I'll show you what, what people have added for Mr. Cooper in a moment. Uh, it might even be a way of connecting with people um, who are researching the same person. And in Cooper's test, there's a photograph up there, which clearly comes from a family collection. Uh, he's in uh, the Album of Honor for Brant County. There's a couple of other photographs there that uh, are certainly not on his file, okay? And there are some documents there that are clearly from his file. So someone has sent this material to Veterans Affairs to be posted against his name on the Canadian Virtual War Memorial. So it, it's, it's, it really is something neat. And it's, um, I think it's wonderful that Veterans Affairs does this. The Merchant Navy, again, is, is different from the other, the three services. Uh, there is now a book of remembrance, and I told you that the files are at Veterans Affairs Canada. Uh, there's a, a, a good bud of mine, uh, Bob Dau, uh, down in Waterloo, uh, who has put together not one, but four books on the Merchant Navy, and he's looked at every person who died, okay? Um, and, and there's uh, well, 1,700, Bob's going to correct me, 1,750 who died. Uh, history of the ship they were on, the event, the sinking, uh, if you will, other crew members. Uh, and he's used the documents like the one I showed you earlier uh, to tell a little bit about each and every merchant seaman who died uh, in, in the Second World War. And um, it's just wonderful. It's, it's one of the better places to get this information because, of course, it's not uh, readily available in the detail uh, that, that Bob has in these books. And Veterans Affairs will help you. Uh, they do have a war dead registry and you would get that kind of information that I showed you. And also on this website, you can, you can ask for a file. And, and, and they, in fact, do suggest that you use the access to information law and plunk down your five bucks if you're looking for a merchant seaman. Now, there's another source, and I, you know, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, when I ran across it a, a few years ago, several years ago, I was quite taken with it. Unfortunately, it's only uh, for veterans who were from the provinces of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and both provinces um, had a program in the 90s where they would identify physical features in the province and name them after a veteran, okay? In doing so, they created biographies of the veterans, and there are two books that deal with this, one for Manitoba and one for Saskatchewan. And you can see uh, they're not extensive um, biographies, although some are. Uh, I just chose these three at random. Uh, the first one, Alexander Kozak, is commemorated by Kozak Island. Uh, which is in North Knife Lake, and that's in Saskatchewan. Uh, the second one, Rudolph Ruck, Ruck Lake in Manitoba. And likewise, Herbert Morrison is remembered by Morrison Lake. And it says there it's northwest of Wells Lake. It was named after him in 1995. Uh, again, a very interesting um, way to commemorate veterans. And Sort of one sort of wishes every other province had done the same thing, but if it's Manitoba and Saskatchewan is, is of your interest, uh, those, those, those two books are, are really very, very important. And just a word about honors and awards. You're going to see this on a service file. There's going to be a card, uh, a five by seven index card, and it will indicate the various medals that a person received. Now, most veterans have service medals, depending on where they served, okay? But if, if uh, he received a gallantry award, that would be indicated as well. This is from the Veterans Affairs website and their section on medals, uh, not only do they have color illustrations, but they have a, a, a sort of little history of the medal and the requirements for the medal. And it's important to have, and uh, it's, it's sort of a good place to, to, to look at the medals and understand them a bit more. If you're looking for a citation, here would be someone who received a military cross or a distinguished conduct medal. Uh, there is, of course, a database at Library and Archives Canada. And this one, in fact, goes right back to the War of 1812. If you're not familiar with it and you're interested in some of those other military events like 1885 resistance or South Africa or whatever, uh, First War, 
uh, and certainly they have second war here, and um, it, it, it will tell you uh, what the metal was and that kind of thing. Again, in an oddity, if you want to look at the actual records, you have to go to Ancestry, where they actually have the cards. They're large five by seven cards, and uh, they actually have them on the on their on their website. And again, this military stuff sometimes around Remembrance Day they make it free if you're not a member. Uh, and of course, I know people in Ontario uh, can go to their local library and access Ancestry. And I believe uh, public some public libraries you can do it from home. Certainly here in Ottawa we can. And so I, I suspect most of you out there who are very experienced at doing this know about that. Now, the other thing, and I, you know, we don't have time to go through a lot of this stuff, but you know, histories of the war, like uh, the, the regiments, the squadrons, the, especially the 400 squadrons, the 429, 419, they often have little histories done. Uh, likewise, the ships, um, there's often ships histories. Uh, memoirs, there's lots of le letters available online, that kind of thing from the Second War. Uh, look at the website for the Canadian War Museum, the Veterans Affairs, and even the Legion magazine. If you're not, if you're not 100% sure of, of the war and its, and its chronology, its timeline, uh, take a look at those websites, Veterans Affairs especially, and the Legion magazine. Uh, have lots and lots of information that's freely available on, on the war and, and, and it, I think it would help your understanding. Now the other thing that's happened, the, the Legion and bless them, have created sometime in the either the late 80s or the 90s I think, something called military service recognition books and I think this is rather a dandy source to know about. Um, it's done by provincial commands. Uh, the Legion is organized by province. They ask for uh, people in their area to submit biographical information about people in their family who served in the military and to supply a photograph if available. And also to add any stories or reminiscences. Okay, whatever they know about Uncle George who served in the Second War, send it in. Uh, these military service recognition books also include First War and militia veterans. It includes British veterans and it also goes beyond 1945 to include people in the military, for example, uh, in the 50s, 60s, peacekeepers, so on and so forth. Uh, some volumes I noticed included war brides uh, separate from their husbands and that kind of thing. Um, it's, uh, there's over, are you ready? There's over 90 volumes of this. Some commands have 15 or 18 volumes, like Ontario, for example. The good news is they're all online. They're all free. Um, they're very dependent on advertising. That's how they publish them. And so you have to wade through a lot of local advertising uh, to get to the, the really good stuff. The Ontario volumes have a, uh, the Ontario Provincial Command has a, a, a master index to their volumes. And I think they've got about 17 volumes. Um, but anyway, I'll just show you what one of these looks like. So I'm, I'm really happy this stuff's available. Uh, this is from volume three. And you can see they've got two people there from the, uh, from the Second World War, the top two. And the guy on the bottom there, though, he, he's, he's from the First World War. And it's very interesting. You can see the fellow at the top there. It's quite a, quite a detailed uh, biography of what he did in the war. And some of them, in fact, go beyond the war. Text about what they did uh, when they came back from the war and that kind of thing. So it, it might not, if you're looking for a family member, you're probably going to know about them. But if you're looking for that, that, that uncle or that in-law that you don't know a lot about, and he happens to turn up in one of these books, it, 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 really is, it really is a bonus. Now, if you get tired of looking at websites and books and whatever else you look at to do your research, you can do this. Uh, the Real War. Uh, on the National Film Board website, there is something called War, Conflict and Peace, uh, World War II archival films. Uh, but better still are the newsreels, and uh, I don't remember this because I'm not old enough, but uh, if you went to the movie theater in the 1940s, there was often a newsreel, and it was an army film newsreel, 
uh, eight to 10 minutes. These are available. The War Amps of Canada put them together some years ago, actually, on, on, um, on uh, DVDs and called Canadian Army Newsreels. The Archives uh, uh, has a list of them, but you can also watch them on YouTube. And, and uh, it, it makes a real difference watching them on a big television set than it does on your computer. Um, Ancestry now has the Army Newsreels and they've indexed them in the sense that they've taken the captions and they've indexed the captions, which is really not very helpful. Um, but if you know if you just get tired of doing research and you want to look at some of this stuff from the war, uh, it gives you a real sense of of what was happening, and and they're they they really are interesting to watch. And uh, but finally, I think the the main message I have is to you know order that copy of your ancestor's service record. That's where everything begins, and then it's going to be Army, Navy, Air Force, um, it, it, and then that sends you off in a different direction. Uh, for Army, of course, you'd go to the War Diaries, Air Force, you'd go to the Operations Record Books, and so on and so forth. Uh, there could very well be other archival records. Um, the LAC, uh, of course, the National Defense have written official histories of the Army and the Air Force, and in doing so, um, had a lot of records that, that uh, they had pulled from the system back after the war. And those are now in the archives, so it, it's almost overwhelming. And of course, there's lots of published sources around and, and online research. We're all familiar with these various websites that will help us. And I think, I think Glenn has reached the end of the line here. So uh, I don't know if we've got time for questions or whatever, but I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I can only assume, not seeing you, that I haven't put anyone to sleep. Thank you very much. Well, I can honestly say I'm not asleep. <laughs> um, if you can stop sharing, I'll bring my uh, screen back up. Um, yep. Okay. Great. So. I'd like to thank you, Glenn. This was really interesting. <laughs> and, and of course, I have a father who was in World War II as a, as a uh, pilot of a bomber. So um, I found your stuff that you talked about, the orbs, very wow. good. Um, another thing I noted was the, I had never heard of the Royal Canadian Legion Military Service Recognition Book. So Thank you for another avenue. For I, I, sort of, I sort of think that anyone doing uh, family history or genealogy should know about them. And like I said, they're all online. So one would go do a Google search, uh, Ontario Command Military Recognition, then it comes up right away. Very good. Well, I'll tell you right now, the questions have been hopping. <laughs> uh -oh. So we definitely have time. So um, I'll start. Um, so Graham asked, is LAC planning to digitize all World War II service files as they did for the World War I files and eventually put them online when enough time has passed? Uh, my, my guess is no, because of the extent of the files. Um, the first step, what we're hoping for, um, um, and I mean, we, the family history community, are hoping that they um, declare the records archival. Okay, this is sort of a, uh, uh, there's a bit of a nuance here in archives and um, the records are not quote unquote archival yet because they're still used. I mean, the records are still called upon by Veterans Affairs. So if you had a, uh, a grandfather or a father who was going into a, 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 a long-term care home, which is kind of scary these days, but you know, the, or, or was requesting a benefit from Veterans Affairs, Veterans Affairs has first call in the files. So the files are still being used. And I think that's what's holding that back. Uh, whether they would ever digitize them all, I don't know. We're talking 30 kilometers of shelf space. So I, it, it, it would be a horrendous job. But uh, what we can hope, if they, if they declare the records archival, then they would be generally available, much like the first war records were about 1992 or three. Yeah. 
Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, it's I love to hear nuances. <laughs> <laughs> so Wesley is asking, in case he does not cover this, I'm interested to find out if there's a systematic effect to use DNA to identify the unknowns of World War II. Any hints on that side? You mean um, un unknown? Unknown soldiers of World War II as they find them. Um, oh, well, National Defense does that. Um, if, if uh, is it Wesley? If he's not familiar with the program, uh, he should look at the website for the Directorate of History and Heritage, National Defense, and they have a link to the group who actually do that work. Uh, wow. Last time I heard her, it was, a, it was a, a fairly young woman, in fact, who was in charge of it. And uh, they were primarily interested, of course, in the First World War. And like other countries, um, especially the United States, uh, there is a program actually at National Defense for the identification of unknown remains. Very good. Um, Brian, he asked, one of my uncles, a Canadian, ended up in the RAF. Um, is that a completely different source you need to use? Well, if, uh, yeah, I should have mentioned this. Uh, the air crews in the Second World War uh, did not respect nationality. Now, the one I showed you, uh, Charles Austin Wright, I think all seven members of the crew were RCAF. I have seen seven member crews that included, you know, two Canadians, two Brits, an Australian, in fact, one case, even an American, okay? So it's a mixed crew. And in fact, I was asked that question the other day. Someone said, well, my, my, my father, my grandfather flew with the RAF, but he, he joined the Air Force in Canada. And that, that tells me that he was with the RCAF. There's only gonna be one file. If he joined in Canada, he's RCAF and the file would be in Ottawa. But now, the, orb, was a, the orbs he, would be National Archives in England, wouldn't they? No, they, no uh, yes. And I believe, uh, they might be online at the National Archives. They might be, yeah. 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 Because I have that same thing. My, my dad's crew was half Canadian, half English, yeah. and the ground crew was English, and he flew off an RAF base. That's right. But he, he joined the RCAF here, didn't he, Nancy? That's right. That's right. So his file's a Canadian. It's a, he's a Canadian file, yeah. Okay. But the, uh, the um, orbs are definitely over in England because I saw some when I was over there. I had okay. one day at the National Archives and I looked at yeah. some of them. Yeah. Okay, so Jim is asking, uh, his uncle was a pilot, a Canadian uncle, was a pilot shot down in Germany, POW for three years at the infamous Stalag Luft III, uh, which is the scene of the great escape. What is the best way to connect with historians and share documents related to his experience? Wow, Jim has documents relating to his experience. Um, I uh, uh, again, um, you know, there's been a lot of books written about POWs and escapes and stuff. Uh, that fellow in Toronto that writes a lot of books, uh, Barris, what's his name? I oh, Ted Barris. Yes, yeah. uh, Ted Barris. Um, uh, uh, you know, I suspect there are also um, uh, groups online that, that uh, uh, specialize in, in POWs and that kind of thing, yeah. 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 So, Jim, um, if you send an email to me at durhamchair at ogs.on.ca, I have Ted Barris's uh, email address and can put you in touch. Okay, moving on. Uh, Vicky asks if an applicant for World War II service had been previously in World War I, would that be indicated in his file? Uh, yes, it will be. Yeah. Very yeah, good. For, for certain. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, Sean has a, a World War I question. Yeah. Okay. And he says it's okay if we don't have time to answer it, but I'll say it anyway. Is there an archive for regimental pictures from World War I? I found different regional sites, like for instance, Elgin County has the 91st Battalion, but is there an official records uh, site for regimental pictures? 
No, uh, there, there isn't. Uh, I know the War Museum has, has a number of them, um, especially those long ones where the whole battalion is shown. It's about three feet long, eh? Um, right. and, and, and looking locally is probably the best place to look for them, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 there are some. Um, uh, they were published very early on in the war, and I've only seen them at the War Museum where different units uh, had group pictures taken and, and people were identified, but they're very unusual and, and not very common. So I think it's best to look locally because a lot of those uh, battalions in the First World War really reflect the area from which they were recruited. And as we know, uh, it, was, it was done in small towns and in small cities and that kind of thing where most of the men came from one specific area. So I would look in uh, local museums, local archives, even local libraries for that matter, uh, for that okay. kind of thing, yeah. But there's no central repository that I know of. Okay. Deborah's asking, would the records for the first special services force be available? Uh, I, I don't see why they wouldn't be. Um, was that a, it was Canadian, right? Yeah. Um, sure, if the person served uh, in uniform in, in, in the Canadian forces, then the file is going to be there in the archives. Okay. Wendy says, my grandfather was an aircraft mechanic. Would the mechanics have orbs? Well, not the mechanic. It would be the unit that he was working with. If it was a squadron, say, 429 squadron, then that would be the orb that one would look at. Would it be very like very likely that aircraft mechanics would be mentioned in an order? Uh, no, but uh, what I would do in his case anyway, or her case, is to, uh, if, if I had a copy of his file, I would like to see where he, how he ended up as air crew. Where would, did he train? Did he sign on in 1940 or 41 and was, uh, he might have been trained for something uh, a lot different and didn't work out, okay? So he wasn't, he was, didn't have it to be a pilot, didn't have it to be a navigator, but they found him something to do. So that would be documented. And he may very well have moved around Canada for training. Okay. So it's important that that's why it's important to get the file and see exactly where one was trained and so on and so forth. And that would lead you to the uh, operation record books. Okay. Uh, Kathleen asks, does the D slash D in the Air Force document you showed mean discharged dead as it did in the C.S. Forrester books about Horatio Hornblower? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, believe, I believe it does stand for that, yes. Okay. Some things don't go away, do they? No, no, unfortunately. No. Um, so... Kim asked, uh, I ordered my great uncle's World War II record on the attestation paper. It was stamped, fingerprinted, and photographed, but neither were included in the file. Why would he be photographed, and where might he find it? Uh, you might, you might want to send an email back to the archives and ask them that question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Brian uh, asked, uh, you mentioned two other presentations this week on the subject. Uh, could the information of those events be repeated? Now, I have a slide about the OGS webinar, but I don't, don't remember what your second one was. The second one was the Canadian War Museum. And if you went to the Canadian War Museum website, uh, there's a link there to, to, to register. And so it's, it's, it's like an OGS webinar. You have to register in advance. And apparently they're going to have talk, a uh, talk or talks in French and English on on military service generally. Okay, but probably specifically on the first two, uh, first and second world war. Okay. That's the Canadian War Museum. So Vicky is asking if a person was in the reserve, what does that actually mean? Uh, reserve for the Navy or the Army or. Um. I have a feeling it was when you were talking about the Navy. Yeah, well, they, they served as well, okay? And, and uh, they weren't regular members of the Royal Canadian Navy. Uh, there was always a, 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 a reserve um, 
um, uh, I was going to call them groups, in different parts of Canada that have been around since the 1920s, after the first war. And so these would be your, uh, you know, they, they, the people would train and, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, come 1939, 1940, they were needed. And so they were, they would volunteer to serve uh, like anyone else. Well, I know there's still reserves nowadays be because mm -hmm. my sister and brother-in-law were part of the Naval Reserve. Yeah, yeah, same kind of thing. If, if yeah. something broke out tomorrow, they'd be eligible. Yes. Yeah, unlikely, but anyway. Okay, so uh, Betty Jean asked, what were those two websites you mentioned for information on ships, bases, et cetera? Okay, there's two. Uh, the first one, all one word is ready, I ready. Okay. And okay. the second one, which is unbelievable in the amount of information is all one word for posterity's sake. Okay, and I'm assuming there's no apostrophe in that. No, it's all one word. No, 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 no grammar. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, Verna asked about if there was a handout, and I do have a slide at the end of uh, my presentation with Glenn's email if you're interested in getting uh, some sort of a handout from him. Uh, Grant, um, oh, sorry, and Verna also asked, is there any information about conscientious objectors for World War II? Okay, uh, there is actually, if one looks at the um, website of Library and Archives Canada and does collections search, okay, um, one will see that there are a lot of files dealing with uh, uh, objectors, uh, largely Mennonites, Dukabars, uh, adherents of Seven Day Adventists, uh, and some other religious groups. Uh, there are, best of my knowledge, there's no list of names or anything like that. Um, I, I, I looked but couldn't find any kind of uh, sort of uh, academic work on, on COs in the Second War. There is a book on the First War. Uh, and, you know, she might want to look there. I, it's hard to know what she's looking for. If it's information about an individual, I suspect it won't be there. But that's, that's just my feeling. Okay. Grant says, can Glenn discuss the usual waiting time after service records are ordered? He requested records in April 2020 and has not heard anything from LAC. And I asked if he used the ATIP $5 route or just a request, and he said just a request. Yeah, that's the problem right there. Should, um, should he turn around and do ATIP now and spend the five bucks? I, I, I think he probably should. Um, and uh, I've been I've been waiting um, oh about six months on the last one. You know they're they're, they're well behind, but they have to do the ATIP ones first, okay? Because we under the legislation, uh, the ATIP legislation, they have to deal with us first because we 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 went in under the act and we put down our five bucks. So okay. the people that just sent in a normal request are at the bottom of the list. Sounds like a good. Five dollars spent. <laughs> it is. It's a good investment. Okay, I have a comment from Anne. She said that the Navy magazine was called the Crow's Nest. Yes. Okay. Um, I have quite a long topic, a talk, uh, post here from Kathleen about the geographic features. The, um, She's saying that the naming of the features after World War II casualties was more extensive in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, the lists were used as sources for names for unnamed features when the federal government started mapping after World War II. Um, the books for Manitoba and Saskatchewan ca casualties were only about a half inch thick. Ontario had two books about one and a half inch thick. The BC's book was about a one, one inch thick and other provinces were similar. You can check the Canadian Geographic Names Database, CGNDB, to see if there's a future named after a casualty of interest. But aside from Manitoba and Saskatchewan, the full lists of names for most jurisdictions have not been used up. 
Oh, okay. Go. Cool. I'm glad. I'm glad to know that. Yeah, that's really okay. that's that's news for me. That's good. I am. You know, here's a. This is cute. I do recall there was one soldier who it was said would never be commemorated because he was a murderer. <laughs> She does there's no proof that it's true, but it, he was either Manitoba or Saskatchewan. Um, so Michelle says that was terrific, great ideas. Thank you for excellent presentations. I learned a lot. Uh, presentation was wonderful, very informative. Uh, I have been waiting more, more than three years for my dad's records. That's from Sharon. I think Sharon should do the ATIP. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tricia says, uh, are there any pictures of units in World War I or World War II? We sort of have answered that. Well, yeah, the first World War, you can see these, these battalion pictures. I mean, a battalion's about 1,000 men. So these long, they're about three, three feet long, right? Um, the second war, generally speaking, there are a lot more photographs and a lot more people are identified. There is a feature on the LAC website and now on Ancestry, but on the LAC website called Faces of the Second World War, and it's a collection of photographs where people have been identified. Okay. Okay. So I, I think there's there's probably more. Uh, for the second war than the first where where people are identified. Okay, so I'm just going to finish off with, um, oh, wait a minute, I've got one last one here. Uh, where would you find information about prisoners of war? And I'm assuming Canadian prisoners of war. <laughs> yeah, I, th I, uh, I, you know, you, you got me here. I, I think there's um, um I, I would I would start off with a Google search and just to see what there is. I, a lot of people have have looked at prisoners of war, and um, it it might be worth uh, worth doing it that way. Uh, and of course, um, uh, it you can still fetch the file too is is still there, and it will tell you uh, where the person was incarcerated, um, which is uh, what you're probably trying to find out. Um, but that's one way to go about it. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to have to cut it off about there. Okay. Um, I do have one here that was a comment. Project44.ca, free online software supported by Veterans Affair, provides an interactive map for Canadian Army operations in France, Belgium, and Holland linked by, day by day to the war diaries by battalion or regiment. Nope. Okay, yeah, that is, that's an excellent website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. Um, I, I'm